taking you to mother. Riddle me this, fellow gamers. Why does every quirky indie RPG have to be inspired by the Mother games? Where are all the games based on the magic of Scheherazade? I respect your intelligence enough to know that if you clicked on this video, you probably don't need me to go into too much detail about Nintendo's cult classic RPG trilogy, Mother, or Earthbound as it's known in the States. Its influence can't be overstated. Everybody's made video essays about it. Everybody rightfully loves it. You know who really loves it? Undertale creator Toby Fox. This is a video of Toby Fox creating Undertale. Hey mom, check out Toby's new trick! Toby! I'm just playing Toby, you know I love you. Though I'm still waiting on the royalties for your usage of the Mario Paint sound effects I ripped when I was 13. It shouldn't come as a huge surprise that one of the strongest and most fascinating things about the Mother games is their music, considering the two main composers of the first two games were already established heavy hitters before they even got involved with Mother. Hirokazu Hip Tanaka, otherwise known as Chip Tanaka, had been working with Nintendo as a composer and sound programmer slash engineer basically since the beginning of their game development history, designing sound hardware and doing sound effects for their earliest arcade games like Space Firebird, Radar Scope, and eventually Donkey Kong, and moving on to do soundtracks for stuff like Metroid, Kid Icarus, Super Mario Land, and motherfucking Snoopy Concert, let's fucking go! Meanwhile, the better part of Keiichi Suzuki's body of work is stuff outside of video game music. He formed a rock band in the mid-70s called Moon Riders. Moon Riders. And around the beginning of the 80s, he'd be one half of musical duo The Beatniks, alongside drummer and lead vocalist of Yellow Magic Orchestra, Yukihiro Takahashi. Seasoned motherheads probably already know that while Shigesatsu Itoi is only really known in the West for being the creator of Mother, in Japan he's more of a multidisciplinary Donald Glover type public figure whose life is an amalgam of increasingly bizarre side quests, from writing to acting to copywriting to bass fishing to uh, championship monopoly playing. And one of these side quests was having collaborated with Keiichi's. Suzuki and other members of Moonriders on an album called Penguinism, on which he wrote all the lyrics and sang lead vocals. <laughs> It was this established creative relationship with Suzuki that led Itoi to hire him for Mother. While Tanaka and Suzuki would handle compositional duties about equally, Tanaka would handle the technical side, which was a bit different than the tracker software we often associate with the chiptune music production of today. Tanaka mentions that it was common for composers and sound designers to compose music in PC sequencers of the day and convert the MIDI data from these sequencers to code readable by the Famicom, but Tanaka preferred to use his own software and painstakingly type out every note and pitch articulation in 6502 assembly code. While Tanaka was sitting at the computer, Suzuki would be sitting next to him playing his songs on instruments and asking Tanaka to convert them to code. The music of the Mother series is diverse and eclectic. Pop, psychedelic rock, metal, rockabilly, ragtime, dub, acid. Uh, Mother 2 has a lot of really creative usage of weird sample manipulation too. Uh, you can really tell it's a game that came just barely at the tail end of the golden age of hip hop. Sample sources include everything from the Beatles to the Monty Python's flying circus intro to the Little Rascals intro to probably my personal favorite, the euphoric and tranquil opening of the Beach Boys' is Deirdre getting flipped on its head for the fucking nightmarish Cave of the Past music. <laughs> Now that's what I call transformative. Sources for samples are still being newly discovered as recently as September 2022, which is kind of insane, but there are already plenty of great videos and articles documenting these samples, so I won't go into crazy detail. In 2003, to promote the Game Boy Advance re-release of the first two Mother games, Shigesatsu Itoi's official website published an article wherein Suzuki and Tanaka talk about all the albums they were listening to, which helped inspire the music of the first two Mother games. And for anyone who loves the music of the Mother games and is looking to get into more music like it, this is basically basically the ultimate study guide directly from the composers themselves. So in tonight's video, what I want to do is go through these albums, give a bit of context on each artist, and if I can, go into a bit more detail about how an album evokes the Mother soundtrack. I'll make comparisons to specific tracks if I feel they're warranted, but sometimes music will evoke the vibe or ethos of Mother without really having any specific compositional similarities, so it's not a hard and fast rule. A few disclaimers though, Tanaka and Suzuki are the main composers for the first two Mother games, but Mother 2 also has additional music by Toshiyuki Ueno,
Kino and Hiroshi Kanazu. And I don't want to downplay the work they did on Mother 2's soundtrack, but the article I'm referencing only interviews Tanaka and Suzuki, so they'll be the main points of reference here. Also, the article only talks about the first two Mother games. Suzuki and Tanaka were both busy during the development of Mother 3, so its soundtrack was handled exclusively by Shogo Sakai, who did a remarkable job, but sadly this means that there won't be much talk of Mother 3 in this video as much as I love it. Maybe that's a topic for another video though, who knows. This video was really hard to make though, so don't get your hopes up. Another disclaimer also, there's a great video by Mecha Biozilla called The Mother Music Iceberg Explained, which I honestly had no idea existed until I was already well into the scripting phase of this video, and like, I've watched a bit of it, but I stopped because I was worried about accidentally stealing ideas from it. I think it's a good companion piece to this video though. I'd say that this video covers less topics in more detail, and their video covers more topics in less detail, if that makes sense. Anyway, close your eyes. It's time for me to break all of your limbs. Oh! White guy making six to twenty-seven minute videos about increasingly esoteric obsessions. What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. Hey everyone, Geno7 here. If deflecting upwards of 40 copyright claims from my Queen video has taught me anything, it's that this video is highly unlikely to be monetizable. And that's where the Geno7 Fun Club comes in. I recently lowered the membership price from $3 to a pay what you feel like $1 minimum, and there's a patron Q&A as well as plenty of cool behind the scenes stuff on my comics, videos, and music. This is how I make a living, so if you'd like to become a club member, I'd sincerely appreciate it. Give me money. Probably one of the most legendary unreleased albums in popular music is the Beach Boys album Smile. Intended to be the follow-up to their now legendary the released album, 1966's Pet Sounds, Smile was to be an album of nigh unmatched ambition and scope, almost entirely composed and produced by the Beach Boys' mad genius frontman Brian Wilson, along with additional lyrics and arrangement by composer, arranger, and lyricist Van Dyke Parks. Unfortunately, a ton of problems, including legal battles with their record label, Brian Wilson's perfectionism and declining mental stability and Van Dyke Parks' departure from the project after a lot of creative clashes eventually led to the Beach Boys abandoning the allegedly over 50 hours of tape produced from about a year of sessions. And in its place, Wilson and the Beach Boys would take the ambition and scope of Smile and push it in the total opposite direction. In a makeshift home studio at Wilson's house, using only some radio broadcasting equipment, a few instruments, and found objects, they would record a super intimate stripped-down version of Smile's material, which they would release as Smiley Smile in 1960. I'm gonna keep welding my vegetables card up and sell my vegetables are it would be tempting to see Smiley Smile as kind of a diet version of Smile, and I think especially in the afterglow of Pet Sounds, the sentiment at the time was that it was supremely underwhelming. But in 2004, Wilson would enlist the help of Parks in going back and basically re-recording and finishing Smile as originally intended. And 2011 would see the release of The Smile Sessions, a compilation made up of all the original abandoned studio sessions for Smile. And I think now having the benefit of knowing what the original album basically would have sounded like makes it easier to appreciate Smiley Smile as its own thing. Do it! If I only had a little <laughs> There's a distinct charm to its homemade feel, and it would end up becoming super influential to the development of genres like lo-fi music and bedroom pop. The setting of the Mother Games is a cartoonishly exaggerated America filtered through the lens of a Japanese person absorbing American pop culture, so it would only stand to reason that for the music, Suzuki and Tanaka would lean towards influences that were not just American, but quintessentially American, and this is something you notice a lot going forward. Suzuki calls Smiley Smile a really mysterious album that's packed with the brightness and darkness of America, and I think that describes the Mother Games pretty well. He also points out that the super stark percussion on the album, consisting mostly of found objects had an enormous influence on Mother's sound, which is something you can hear especially in Mother 2. A sort of minimalist percussion style is a crucial part of the soundtrack's DNA, with the bongo samples being especially reminiscent of Smiley Smile. Smiley Smile-esque percussion is in too many of Mother 2's songs to count. I also think I hear Smiley Smile's influence on the tracks that are more uh, dirgy, with a focus on swirling atmospheric harmonies.
But if you were to ask me what the most Smiley Smile-esque Mother 2 track was, I might say Apple Kids theme. The minimalist percussion, the sort of off-kilter melody, the uh, shuffle rhythm that the Beach Boys use really often, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Speaking of the Beach Boys, 1988 would see Brian Wilson putting out a great self-titled debut solo album. Tanaka talks about how he'd listened to this CD a lot on his way to Suzuki's house during the production of The First Mother, and if he arrived a little early, he'd wander around the area listening to it, which is extremely relatable. This is one of the few times in the article where we actually get specific tracks highlighted as being key influences on Mother. In particular, Love and Mercy seems to evoke Mother's overworld songs, particularly Pollyanna and its rhythm and descending bass line. Uh, and Baby Let Your Hair Grow Long does have kind of the same vibe as the indoors music. At least it kind of sounds to me like it's using the same mode and the same key. While we're in the orbit of the Beach Boys, I want to highlight Van Dyke Parks. I mean, I've, I've recently met some Beatles, uh, individuals, and I hold nothing against them. They're handsome. He's mostly known for having worked with Brian Wilson on Smile, but he's kind of an unsung hero of music, mostly making his career as an arranger or a sideman for a ton of well-known musical acts over the years. One of his most notable ventures to me is him having written all of the absolute banger musical numbers for 1987's The Brave Little Toaster. I can't take this kind of pressure. I must confess, one more dusty road would be just a road too long. But in 1967, after being signed to Warner Brothers in the aftermath of his failed collaboration with Brian Wilson, Parks would put out his debut solo album, Song Cycle. This is an album that I absolutely adore, not just for the lush blankets of orchestration befitting of an album that reportedly had nearly triple the recording budget of an average pop album of the time, but for its song structure, or lack thereof. It's something that's difficult to articulate with just snippets, but most of the songs on the album have this through-composed stream-of-consciousness structure that seamlessly leaps from disparate idea to disparate idea, which is a musical style I really tend to gravitate towards, especially as someone who has a <clears throat> A D D A D D Am I dying? Song Cycle is so dripping with Americana that listening to it almost feels like you're being taken on a journey across America. And Keiichi Suzuki talks about the album and a lot of its contemporaries recorded at Warner's Burbank Studios having a really archetypal late 60s West Coast American sound, which was key to the music of Mother. I think especially in its flirting with genres like bluegrass and ragtime. My motivation is, is to uh, change the course of Western music. <laughs> I haven't liked the way it's been going, so I decided I'd make another record. Can I give all these people the finger? <laughs> Someone who's worked with Van Dyke Parks, and someone whose name comes up a lot in Tanaka and Suzuki's interviews when discussing the main influences on Mother's Sound, is one Randy Newman. In particular, Tanaka brings up two of his albums, 1977's Little Criminals and 1988's Land of Dreams. You no doubt know him best for his soundtrack work with Disney Pixar, but make no mistake, the clean-cut soundtrack work Randy Newman that gets made fun of by the likes of Doug Walker and Family Guy is decidedly not the same Randy Newman on his solo album work. The real Randy Newman is a Randy Newman who juxtaposes his jaunty Americana pop with bitingly ironic and often darkly humorous lyrics that satirically espouse the point of view of bigots or assholes. And sometimes this irony is a heart-wrenching sort of dramatic irony, like the seminal title track on his album Sail Away, but sometimes it goes in the other direction, like the opening track of Little Criminals, one of his most infamous lead singles, Short People. Short people got I'm not gonna lie, 
This is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever heard. Bewilderingly though, its surprise chart success at the time attracted ire from a lot of people who didn't get the joke and thought that Newman might have actually been calling for the genocide of short people. And it, and it made the news, didn't it? it went short with oh people. yeah, it was like a fad. If you're gonna have a hit, it's like I was punished. It's the worst kind of hit you could have. People were throwing darts at my, you know, at parties, they throw pies at my picture, and burning the album. And Look, these people are having fun, and they're short. It's a short people party, for a short people song. Listen, if there's anything modern internet culture has taught us, it's that Poe's Law is one of the trickiest things to navigate when it comes to satire, and I'll even admit that Newman's songs work to varying degrees of success and tend to require a lot more context than the average listener might have, but how could anyone honestly have thought that this song was serious? I don't know, as someone who's 6'2", maybe I'm just biased and I'll never know the plight of the vertically challenged. Land of Dreams, meanwhile, being a later effort, leans heavier toward a more synthetic sound and is a bit more experimental, uh, pushed to its logical extreme when Newman suddenly decides to start spitting bars. Get on the mic, be number one, even top DMC and run. I'll admit, the chasm between what I thought Newman was and what he actually is is probably the widest. If any artist here is fascinating enough to deserve a deep dive, it's him. Newman's influence seems to ring pretty strongly to me in Mother's Twinkle Elementary theme. The bass line is, fittingly enough, almost identical to that of Short People. I mean, it's a really common chord progression. I, I think it's called a 1625. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, though. Over that, though, we get this descending ostinato that really does sound like it could be a Newman piano riff. Also, I promise not every one of these is just going to be me comparing shit to Pollyanna, but like, there are a lot of songs on Land of Dreams that sound like they're part of Pollyanna's gene pool. Mainly, it's money that matters and falling in love. Uh, not to be confused with Fallen Love. Tucson's music also sort of has a Land of Dreams vibe, uh, at least to me. Only the shadows of their eyes. Before we leave the Randy Newman cinematic universe, we should talk a bit about Harry Nielsen. My first introduction to Nielsen's work was Robert Altman's 1980 live-action Popeye movie, which he did all the musical numbers for. Seems like everywhere, people front blue Nielsen is a fantastic singer-songwriter in his own right, and it's often said that he was one of the earliest artists to make vocal harmonies by overdubbing layers of his own voice. And a critic in reviewing the album said, it was a wonderful album and I love the music, but Nielsen should have credited the background singers, not realizing the background singers were Nielsen. <laughs> Suzuki brings up Nielsen Sings Newman, a sparsely arranged album wherein Nielsen sings a bunch of Randy Newman songs and swathes Newman's piano playing in layers of vocal harmony over dubs. Suzuki doesn't really offer much insight beyond it's a good album, and uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, admittedly, it doesn't give me much to work with, though. Uh, something I guess I'll say is that, like, my knowledge of music theory is patchy, but something that shows up a lot in Newman's songs, as well as in Beach Boys and Beatles stuff, is the tendency to be really, like, uh, chromatic, or have chord progressions that progress in one direction up or down. And this is something that shows up a lot in Mother's music. Whether or not it's a direct reference, the stepwise descending bass line of Mother's title screen music could be compared to Dayton, Ohio, 1903. Next 
XTC are an English rock band that formed in 1972, and they fucking kick ass, dude. Their early material is characterized by its combination of weird angular sounds and punk energy. If you're into acts like Oingo Boingo, Lemon Demon, or Devo, and uh, let's face it, probably gay, early XTC is exactly the kind of neurotic pop you've been sleeping on. Later on, though, they'd gradually transition into being sort of a neo-psychedelic pop act. Uh, this stuff is really great, too. While they experience middling commercial success throughout their careers, they're recognized as a beloved cult band that were massively formative to genres like power pop, Brit pop, Zolo. Uh, I did mention Oingo Boingo for a reason. Danny Elfman has on multiple occasions admitted to basically jacking Oingo Boingo's whole sound from them. <laughs> it's also suspected that they may have had a big influence on Cardiacs? What, what, who said that? They might be Giants loves them, Primus loves them, Jellyfish loves them, even my boy Shinji Akari loves them. I did not edit this, it's even on the fucking model sheet. While you may not know who XTC frontman Andy Partridge is, you probably know his son, Internet Flash animator Harry Partridge. I'm not kidding. Andy Partridge even wrote a song about the infant Harry that's basically just a three and a half minute dick joke. Don't worry though, Harry would end up getting him back pretty good. Rock Band Oasis! Yes, it's the game that lets you pretend to be the band that pretended to be the Beatles. Also available, pretend to be the Beatles with these other great titles, including Rock Band Klaatu, Rock Band Badfinger, and Rock Band XTC. <laughs> It becomes less of a surprise that Shinji Ikari is XTC-pilled, with the knowledge that XTC is yet another one of those bands that was hugely successful in Japan. In fact, Andy Partridge has even worked with Keiichi Suzuki. He introduces the band on the opening track of the Moon Riders' 1991 album, Christ Who's Gonna Die First. We have Keiichi, we have Toru, we have Hirofumi, Ryomi, Kujira, and Kashibuchi, yes, it's the Moon Riders! What seems to have been the catalyst for the band's popularity in Japan was Andy Partridge's 1980 solo album, Take Away Slash The Lure of Salvage. While the album was decidedly a flop in Partridge's home country, in Japan it was allegedly hailed as a work of electronic genius, and even outsold the three records XTC had produced up to that point. Dub is an electronic music genre that's kind of an offshoot of reggae, which usually consists of experimental manipulations of existing recordings with little to no emphasis on vocals and more emphasis on rhythm sections layered in weird processing effects. Most identifiably reverb, and Takeaway slash The Lure of Salvage consists of dub remixes of XTC tracks, which render the originals nigh unrecognizable. Suzuki lists this album as a huge influence on Mother for its processing and experimentality, and also mentions how much Tanaka loves dub, which is something we'll explore a bit more in a second. You can hear the album's textural influence most strongly in Mother 2. It's hard not to feel like most of the percussion in Mother 2 that wasn't influenced by Smiley Smile was probably influenced by this album, but there's also its synths, its bass sounds, and most especially its electronic experimentation. For just a few examples that come to mind, the chaotic layers of beeping noises on the day they pulled the North Pole down makes me think of the layers of arcade machine samples in On It's Arcade theme. And the noise manipulation which mimics Steam on Steam Fist Futurist is akin to a similar trick in the Belch's factory theme. To me, Inside the Dungeon is the track which comes to mind that I think most strongly evokes the spirit of Takeaway slash The Lure of Salvage, with its pounding rhythm and bizarre sample manipulation. <laughs> As mentioned, Hip Tanaka absolutely loves dub and reggae music, and he groups two albums together here that most influence that side of Mother's OST. 
King Tubby's Prophecy of Dub is a 1976 collaboration between singer-slash-producer Yabby Yu and extremely influential dub mixer King Tubby, said to have brought more public attention to the creative influence of the mixer and recording engineer, and a pioneer of what we now know as the remix in modern popular music. King Tubby's Prophecy of Dub consists of Tubby's dub versions of Yabby Yu's music. The influence of Dub's rhythm, bass playing, and reverb-heavy processing on Mother's music can definitely be felt, especially in Mother 2, with stuff like the indoor music, the hotel music, and the pyramid music, but something that was pointed out by the Mother Music Iceberg video is that the most obvious influence from Prophecy of Dub specifically seems to be Conquering Dub, which bears a resemblance to the hospital music. <laughs> Flying Lizards are an experimental English new wave band formed by David Cunningham in 1979. Tanaka says Cunningham's music and production is extremely influential and mentions that Cunningham was a producer for Michael Nyman, who arranged the version of eight melodies heard on the Mother Lyrical CD. Confusingly though, the album that Tanaka lists is The Secret Dub Life of the Flying Lizards, a series of dub remixes Cunningham made of recordings by reggae artist Ja Lloyd, which was made in 1978, but not released until 1995, a year after Mother 2's release. I guess Tanaka lists this specific album less as an influence and more as one that gives off the vibe of Mother 2 and introduces the reader to Cunningham's production style, and it definitely does. A lot of the more experimental tracks are definitely evocative of Mother 2's dungeon music specifically. I talked about them a little bit in my Silly Queen video, but 10CC are a great English art rock band formed in 1972 which were predominantly made up of four musicians split into two songwriting teams. Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman wrote more of the group's pop-leaning stuff, whereas Kevin Godley and Lowell Cream would write the more experimental cinematic art rock type stuff. In 1976, Godley and Cream would quit 10CC and form their own group, aptly named Godley and Cream, where they'd be free to go wild with their more outlandish ideas, not the least of which was their invention of the Gizmotron, a device which, when attached to the body of an electric or bass guitar, would use motor-driven plastic rubber wheels to make the strings vibrate indefinitely, creating a resonant sort of synthesizer-like sound. And two strings. Godley and Cream's 1977 debut album Consequences was intended to be a showcase of the Gizmotron's sound. It's a sprawling two-hour epic, which feels less like an album and more like a radio play with occasional songs. In the floor on which we stand, there is a large and gaping hole. Let us begin by clarifying whether this hole is with or without prejudice. <laughs> Even as someone who loves art rock and prog rock and thinks the record has some moments of brilliance, I do admit that it's an album whose ambition far overshadows its accessibility. And to make matters worse, the album came out just as punk rock was starting to get big. And being that the album was so exactly the kind of album punk was rebelling against, it almost entered the realm of parody, it flopped like ass. Suzuki notes that the sound of the Gizmotron is, quote, actually quite close to what the resources for in-game music were at the time, and you can hear its influence on the more ambient mother tracks. Suzuki names the track Lost Weekend in particular as a track whose feeling he was trying to get across in the game. The ambient droning synth in Dr. Andernut's lab, occasionally broken by keyboard flourishes, seems to evoke Lost Weekend's blankets of Gizmotron occasionally broken by keyboard flourishes.
There also might be a little bit of it in a flash of memory. On the subject of The Lost Weekend, it's highly likely that Godley and Cream's track gets its name from one of two things. The name that John Lennon gives to the 18-month stint with his personal assistant Mei Peng during a break from his relationship with Yoko Ono, or the thing that John Lennon named this stint after, the 1945 Billy Wilder-directed film The Lost Weekend. I don't think I had any expectations going into this film, but I immediately found myself enthralled with the surprisingly timeless portrait of a self-destructive anti-hero spiraling through alcoholism, enriched by theatrical poetic dialogue. It shrinks my liver, doesn't it, Ned? It pickles my kidneys, yes. But what does it do to my mind? It tosses the sandbags overboard so the balloon can soar. Suddenly I'm above the ordinary, I'm competent, supremely competent. I'm walking a tightrope over Niagara Falls. I am one of the great ones! I really like how much closer older movies feel to plays or novels. I'd definitely recommend giving it a watch. What we really want to focus on here, though, is Miklos Roshka's score for the movie, which Suzuki lists as an influence. If you can excuse it for kind of overusing the same leitmotif with little variation, something that a lot of movies from around this time were doing, it's a fantastic score that's really characteristically Golden Age Hollywood. In fact, the film was allegedly one of the earliest uses of the theremin in a film score, and would help to introduce it to a wider audience, where it would become a staple of horror and sci-fi movies of the 50s. The score's influence comes through to me in the cinematic side of Mother 2's music, especially the songs involving string sections. Stackridge are an English art rock band who, as Tanaka says, emit the fragrance of the Beatles. Tanaka lists Mr. Mick, the final album before their breakup in 1977, but he likes their first, second, and third albums about as much, and mentions that their 1974 album The Man in the Bowler Hat is often said to be their most representative work. With a fleeting glance at a local dance and a cloud of dust in the morning, the girls all stood and stared. It's definitely their most Beatles-esque, uh, probably helped by the fact that it was produced by legendary Beatles producer George Martin. Mr. Mick, more than most, having finished his roast, and every suggestion he made, they ignored. Mr. Mick was originally envisioned and recorded as a sort of bedtime story-esque concept album, with little spoken word couplets breaking up each of the swirling, almost Pink Floyd-esque instrumentals, but their record label sort of butchered it, rearranging the album's order, removing a lot of the spoken word bits, and insisting they open the album with a Beatles cover. The original version of the album was eventually released in 2001, but this rearranged version is the one that came out in 1976, and the one that Tanaka and Suzuki would have heard when they were doing Mother. People often and ascribe the influence of the opening organ riff of The Who's Won't Get Fooled Again on Mother 2's Skyrunner theme, I think another big influence might have been this section of Stackridge's Save a Red Face, though. also notes that Stackridge's early work has the flair of British traditional jazz. He talks, it, it, wait, what the fuck? They have a song called Dora the Female Explorer? Dora, female explorer this album is from 1971. Was she named after this song? Is it just a weird coincidence? Come on, Dora! You're the one with the map! Don't ask me! Uh, whatever, that's its own video. Tanaka talks about how much the sad, sort of heart-rending feel of British folk songs and Irish Celtic music influenced Mother's sound, and mentions traditional Irish folk band The Chieftains as a good introduction to British trad and Celtic music. And listening to The Chieftains was almost a seeing the code in the Matrix moment for me, because I realized just how much Mother's snowman music in particular borrows from Irish Celtic music. 
I think mainly in its mimicking of a very characteristically Irish sounding ornamentation technique called the long roll. It's kind of insane how now I can't unhear Snowman's lead melody as a penny whistle. Frank Zappa might be one of my biggest personal musical influences, but I don't think I even know how to begin to introduce him. He might be better known for being kind of an outspoken political public figure in the 80s, and he's eccentric and a little insufferable, but he's also a musical genius whose life's work was composing and performing some of the most deceptively complex and technically demanding music ever devised and setting it to irreverent comedic lyrics. I eat a hot dog, it tastes real good. Zappa was incredibly prolific, and even before his death, he'd recorded a whopping 62 albums, so it can understandably be daunting to know where to start. It's not helped by the fact that one of the many unique things about Zappa is that there isn't really a delineation between live albums and studio albums in his discography, and live albums will often either feature drastically rearranged versions of studio songs or completely unique material. <laughs> Everyone has their own favorite Zappa, only in it for the money is often said to be a good starting point, and it's great, but I think my personal favorites of his are the mostly instrumental 1969 fusion jazz outing Hot Rats, followed closely by the 1971 live album Just Another Band from LA, where you get to hear vocalists Flo and Eddie at their best. Tanaka's pick, Make a Jazz Noise Here, isn't a bad starting point, but it is kind of a funny starting point, if only because there's a bit of a barrier to entry, with it being front-loaded by two exceedingly long tracks, one of which even includes the dated and sort of obtuse political palaver that Zappa often got up to in his later years. But meanwhile, did everybody hear the great news today? Jimmy Swaggart under investigation. Not that these songs are without a lot of really great musicianship to appreciate, but I think past them is some of the album's best material. A lot of really energetic, mostly instrumental jazz arrangements of existing Zappa tunes, which are really fun and showcase his unique brilliance at melody lines. Even Tanaka is unsure where Zappa fits into Mother as an influence, but it's exceedingly endearing hearing him talk about how much he'd have loved to have asked Zappa and his band to perform live jazz rearrangements of Mother music were Zappa still alive at the time, and even mentions he would have attended all the rehearsals and sat in the second or third row from the front during the performance. <laughs> the Mothers play Mother. Now that I can get behind. <laughs> Tanaka groups together two classic albums that make up Mother's most seminal fusion jazz influences, 830, the 1979 double album by Weather Report, and No Mystery, the 1975 album by Return to Forever. No Mystery and Return to Forever's body of work overall is something I already really loved, but my familiarity with Weather Report doesn't go much further beyond the JoJo character who evaporates your pee, so listening to 830 was a fun bit of discovery. Even Tanaka addresses that Weather Report's influence on Mother isn't obvious at first, but he says to pay attention to what's happening apart from the performances. Dissonance, noise, percussion, filling in the space on top of the rhythm. He also urges listeners to focus on the tone and technique of Joe Zavinol's keyboard and says it's very reminiscent of Mother. He gushes about the beauty of a remark you made, the keyboards of which I do sort of find similar to the Young Town theme, or what would become Paula's theme in Mother 2. Jaco Pastorius' fretless bass playing also seems to have had an influence on the style of Mother 2's bass, especially texturally.
The album's title track is another song I'd say to look at. First off, I find it notable that this song, and additionally the opening track of Stackridge's Mr. Mick, begin with the staticky sound of a radio being tuned. And, like, it must have at the very least put the idea in Suzuki and Tanaka's brains when they do the same thing for the Dusty Dunes music. The rest of the song, though, has sections that strike me as having been influential on Mother 2's title screen music. Directly following the title screen theme, we get some of the OST's most unapologetic embracing of fusion jazz in the intro music, which I think especially could be compared to tracks from Return to Forever's No Mystery. Tanaka mentions being deeply influenced by Return to Forever's chord progressions and chord voicings, as well as the sound of their drums and bass combo. I think that also, like, while the game's Kraken music is certainly more of an acid song than a fusion jazz song, it's hard to ignore the parallels between it and Return to Forever's Sophistifunk. <laughs> I was as surprised as you are to find out that My Bloody Valentine's 1991 genre-codifying shoegaze classic Loveless was an influence on Mother 2's music, but it makes a lot more sense than you'd think. Tanaka loves the band's sound and says there's a flickering quality about Mother 2's music that was influenced by them. I think I tend to associate their music most with the tracks related to Gygus. There's kind of a layered, eerie groaning sound to a lot of MBV tracks that's very Gygus-y, and the slow pitch bending is notably reminiscent of Kevin Shields' whammy bar heavy glide guitar style of playing. This section where Tanaka also espouses the influence of seminal 90s grunge band Nirvana, to the point of dividing his music listening life into pre-Nirvana and post-Nirvana categories. He specifically points out that the drums that kick off the second section of Porky's battle theme are a mini-Nirvana explosion. I'd always thought the track was more thrash metal than grunge, but I think you can hear Nirvana's influence throughout the track, mainly in the sections which isolate the heavily tritonal bass line. Mother 2's sample-heavy music definitely oozes hip-hop influence, and to that end, Tanaka talks about the 1990 album People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm, the debut of legendary alternative hip-hop outfit A Tribe Called Quest. It's a fitting choice. The album was unique at the time for having a much more laid-back and fun attitude than a lot of its contemporaries through not only its grounded lyrics, but its innovative and influential production that sampled a lot of stuff that no one else was really sampling at the time. Tanaka challenges the reader to spot a tiny little secret shared by a track on this album and a track from the Mother games. And I'm pretty sure what he's talking about is both this album and Mother 2 having sampled the same quotation of the French national anthem which kicks off the Beatles' as All You Need Is Love. <laughs> Tanaka 
is embarrassed to admit it, but he says that the music he heard during his nights going out clubbing may have influenced the battle and dungeon music, and he also name drops hip hop groups the Jungle Brothers and De La Soul. I'm not sure whether he means that these were the groups he often heard while clubbing, but I think there's connective tissue there. If Tanaka is in fact referring to Dungeon Man's theme when he says the dungeon music, I'd definitely say it's looping boom bap drum break is where Mother 2's hip hop influence is most overt. Something of note here is that the drum break is a sample of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band reprise. It's a really commonly sampled drum break, and Mother 2 certainly wasn't the first to sample it. One of the earliest mainstream uses in a hip-hop context might be the Beastie Boys' The Sounds of Science from 1989's Paul's Boutique, uh, one of my personal favorite albums. Might this have been an influence? Uh, I don't know. The battle track in Mother 2 with the biggest hip-hop influence to me might be Otherworldly Foe. Many of the other battle tracks opt for more minimalist drum work, but this one has a punchier beat more reminiscent of hip-hop. Prince is an icon of music with a prolific body of work whose unprecedented musicianship is matched only by its versatility. But Prince was, in a lot of ways, an eccentric, and however you feel about his notorious vitriol toward the internet, Prince doesn't comprehend things the way you and I do. His music being so difficult to find on the internet for such a long time is sadly what led to Prince being kind of a blind spot for me when I was really starting to get into music. It's sort of a bittersweet feeling only really being able to get into him after his death, but I'm glad that this video is kind of giving me an excuse to dig into him a bit. Tanaka lists two Prince albums, 1985's Around the World in a Day and 1987's Sign of the Times. He says that, while there's not an explicit feeling of funk in Mother, once in a while, funk influence will creep in through the game's bass phrases and rhythm. If you feel a little, uh, quote, funk when you're playing Mother, that's why. Tracks like It and Raspberry Beret seem like yet another possible influence on some of the game's overworld tracks like Pollyanna and On It. I also hear a bit of the battle themes rhythmically, especially the things that the Ballad of Dorothy Parker does with its drum machine. And Housequake's syncopated new Jack Swingy rhythm could be another influence on otherworldly foes' rhythm. But I hear these two Prince albums most in the theme for The Lost Underworld. The rhythm, the flute, the organ, chord stabs, the kind of like a psychedelic modernization of Indian classical influences, it all combines to create a really around the world in a day type sound. Lalo Rodriguez was a Puerto Rican salsa singer whose 1988 international hit, Ben de Borame Otra Vez, and its rather salacious lyrics cemented him as a pioneer of a salsa subgenre that would come to be known as romantic or erotic salsa. Decidedly less romantic and erotic, though, was his rocky personal life filled with drug abuse, jail time, and domestic violence. He died really recently, actually, uh, only two years ago, of causes that are apparently still being investigated. 
Tanaka talks about how much he loves salsa and lists Rodriguez's 1988 album Un Nuevo Despertar and the 1977 album Fireworks by Latin jazz musician Machito, on which Rodriguez is a special guest artist. He says that Mother 2 has a hint of salsa in the four side theme and the theme of the photographer, and listening to them back to back, the influence is pretty immediately apparent. Wired Magazine is an American magazine that's been running since 1993, and it mainly focuses on emerging technological advancements. In 1999, the magazine partnered with Rhino Records to put out a compilation album called Music Futurists, intended to be a kind of curated history of artists who pushed the envelope of musical technology. It's stacked wall to wall with some pretty great musicians. Devo, Beck, Can, Todd Rundgren, Tangerine Dream, Brian Eno, even our old friends Godly and Cream. However, the critical reviews of the compilation that I've happened upon seem to react to the selection of artists with bewilderment, regarding it as sort of haphazard or incohesive. <laughs> But there's something sort of cool about the fact that it's the very haphazardness with which this collection was assembled that Tanaka regards as so Mother-esque. This album is in a weird spot because, like, while a lot of the songs on it predate Mother, it was packaged and released as a compilation years after both of the first two Mother games, and the songs in the context of a compilation is what Tanaka emphasizes as being Mother-esque. I think this is less of a situation of an album being influential on Mother, and more an album that happens to end up being really Mother-esque. And it's for this reason that Tanaka recommends it to fans of the series. And I can definitely see that. It's a compilation that dips its toes into many of the same genres. Juan Garcia Esquivel gives us a bit of salsa, DJ Spooky, Ben Neal, and Brian Eno give us some really moon sidey ambient music. And Can and Beck both give us strange, twangy, pitch-bend, heavy rock grounded by a grooving rhythm section. The rhythm of Can's song Spoon even sorta of reminds me of the file select music. Tanaka is a fan of Hal Wilner, who isn't a musician, but a music producer known for assembling tribute and compilation albums featuring a wide variety of artists. He highlights two of these albums, 1985's Lost in the Stars, The Music of Kurt Weill, and 1988's Stay Awake, Various Interpretations of Music from Vintage Disney Films. By the Thames's turbid waters Kurt Weill, it, no not that one, there you go, was a German-born American composer mainly active from the late 20s into the 40s, known for his socially satirical stage music. His song Mac the Knife became a popular jazz standard, but in all likelihood you're more familiar with the Super Mario RPG boss that was named after it. Uh, but anyway, Lost in the Stars is Wilner getting a bunch of artists together to do covers of Weill's songs. Stay awake, don't rest your head. Uh, similarly, Stay Awake is exactly what it says it is, Wilner getting a bunch of artists together to do covers of songs from Disney movies. Stay Awake also has some amazing cover art by the one and only Rodney Allen Greenblatt, a man also responsible for creating the embodiment of everything I look for in a romantic partner. The roster on these albums is quite impressive. Standouts include the aforementioned Harry Nielsen, as well as Lou Reed, Todd Rundgren, Tom Waits, Sun Ra, Los Lobos, The Replacements, fucking John Zorn, and such a varied collection of artists naturally begets an eclectic selection of genres, which, like music futurists, is, I think, what carries through into Mother. Tanaka has said, I want to call this Mother-like, too. No, I want the honor of being allowed to call it that. No, I want to beg for the honor of calling it that just one single time. Uh, Lost in the Stars, while occasionally dipping into stuff like the avant-garde, 
thanks John Zorn, sort of radiates the same Americana feeling as Van Dyke Parks' song cycle, probably helped by the fact that Parks himself contributed a handful of tracks to it. The most mother-esque songs on it to me are probably the pounding rhythm and weird synths of Ralph Shuckett and Richard Butler's Alabama song, as well as the banjo and accordion-driven sound of Tom Waits's What Keeps Mankind Alive. In their own ways, they each kind of remind me most of the Saturn Valley theme. says he was listening to Stay Awake all the time, especially during Mother 2's development. I don't know if I'd say anything specific about Stay Awake catches my ears as being Mother-esque, but something that often comes through in Mother is its sweet, wistful melodies, often deeply evocative of childhood nostalgia, and what better place to go to for that than the music of vintage Disney movies? Though I know Mother 2's Eight Melodies is trying to be similar to Mother's Eight Melodies, it's a very Disney-sounding melody, and there could be some connective tissue between it and something like Garth Hudson's rendition of what is admittedly still my personal favorite Disney song, Feed the Birds. Does that make sense? I don't know. To be honest, I've been writing this script for three months and I'm struggling to stay awake myself. The final album that Tanaka lists is actually the album he says introduced him to Keiichi Suzuki. There's frustratingly little information I can find on the band Hachimitsu Pai, but they're one of the earliest music projects Suzuki was involved in, and originally formed around 1971 as a backing band for folk singer Morio Agata. Eventually though, they'd become their own entity and put out an album called Sentimental Turi before breaking up, but many of its members would go on to be in Suzuki's band Moonriders. Seneca recalls fond memories of spending all-nighters listening to Sentimental Turi in the 8th grade. It's a really pretty album, uh, you can definitely hear the sort of Americana influence of Van Dyke Parks and Randy Newman throughout it. Speaking of, if you like the Mother soundtrack, I don't think there's a better artist to check out than Moonriders. They definitely have that same energy in Suzuki's distinctive ear for bizarre but satisfying pop melodies, which is definitely benefited by more lavish arrangements. <laughs> Something I'd like to note here as well, which is, again, something that Mechabiozilla's Iceberg video mentions, one of the most direct connections between Suzuki's mother soundtrack work and his own music can be found on his 1991 solo album, White Report, specifically the song Words, Colors, Noise, and Booms. Astute listeners will notice that this song's melody was reused by Suzuki wholesale for Mother 2's The Lamb music. I've always really liked about the name Mother is that it isn't really immediately obvious why the series is named that. It's a name that means a lot of different things, and Itoi himself has given a lot of different reasons for the name. The most oft-cited, though, is its connection to the John Lennon song of the same name off Lennon's debut solo album after the breakup of the Beatles, John Lennon slash Plastic Ono Band. で
っていう言葉を呼びかけられるってことは、うん、恐ろしいことだなと思ってみんなにもしてやれと<笑>すごいそれ深い The Beatles might be one of, if not the most integral bands to the Mother soundtrack. They're referenced, quoted, and, as mentioned, even outright sampled throughout the Mother games. And Keiichi Suzuki has regularly espoused how important the songwriting of John Lennon specifically was to the Mother soundtrack, emphasizing in particular his themes of love fitting with those of the Mother games. To be honest, when it comes to post Beatles breakup albums, I think the homemade feeling but still immaculately arranged proto indie rock bangers of McCartney's Ram or the warm, consoling hug that is Harrison's All Things Must Pass is more my speed. Plastic Ono Band is sort of sparse and repetitive in a way that makes it difficult to listen to all the way through, but to be fair, it's this very sparseness that Keiichi Suzuki says was encouraging to him when creating music constricted by the NES's hardware limitations. And I think more than anything, what makes Plastic Ono Band a compelling album to me is its context. After the breakup of the Beatles in 1970, Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono would go to American psychologist Arthur Yanov and undergo about five months of primal therapy, an intense form of therapy which involved descending into and reliving repressed memories of childhood trauma. And it was these therapy sessions which would come to shape the album's messy, confessional lyrical content, not the least of which was Lennon exploring his relationship with his parents. His father abandoned him as an infant, and his mother was killed in a car accident when he was only seven. Mama, don't go. Daddy, come home. A lot of the information available in English about Shigesato Itoi's life is unsourced, but luckily, with the help of Cody Nokolo and fan site Mother Forever, I was able to get some translated snippets of the semi autobiography about Shigesato Itoi. Though, in the space of time between me getting the info from Cody and this video getting done, he would end up adding it to the site.、Uh, either way, about Shigesato Itoi details how Itoi himself came from a broken home. His mother left him when he was young, and he was raised by his father and grandfather. In school, on Mother's Day, kids would give red carnations to their moms, but kids without moms would instead receive white carnations, which a young Itoi felt singled out and embarrassed by, and he tried his best not to cry about it. He has no memory of ever being hugged, as he says, after all, I couldn't hug myself. He specifically mentions seeing the Rolling Stone magazine cover featuring the now iconic photo of a naked John hugging a clothed Yoko, which had been taken hours before his murder, and The feeling the cover gave off resonated with Itoi really strongly, and he connected it with John's song Mother. Though never explicitly stated, it doesn't seem out of the question to suggest that the similarities in Itoi's and John's family situations led to Itoi feeling a strong connection to John. And one's relationship to one's parents, as well as the exploration and reliving of childhood experiences that can at times be traumatic, are themes that appear throughout the Mother series. And I guess I should warn you that I'm about to spoil major plot details from all three games, so if you somehow made it this far in the video without having played them, maybe skip to this timestamp. Mother One details the relationship between its extraterrestrial main villain and the human parents which raised it from infancy. Mother Three's plot hinges on the main cast dealing with the loss of a mother figure, and, well, beyond Mother Two's charming homesickness mechanic, parental relationships sort of take a back seat, but childhood memories are a supremely important part of the game. From each of the eight melodies helping Nest to re experience a happy childhood memory, to the amalgam of memories and past experiences that is magicant, where Nest even talks to his younger self, to the battle with Gygus. I'm sorry to do this again, but I should warn you up front that we're about to get a bit heavy here, and if discussion of sexual assault makes you uncomfortable, you're probably best off skipping to this timestamp. It is a story every mother fan has probably heard by now, and it is a misremembering of a fictional sexual assault, FYI, but I figured I should still give you a heads up. Anyhow, I do think that James Nintendo Nerb was on to something when he theorized that Gygus is a manifestation of all of one's childhood fears. It's probably infamous by now that Itoi managed to actually freak out the person interviewing him when he talked about how the battle with Gygus was strongly influenced by an event from his childhood where he accidentally walked into the wrong theater and saw Kyotaro Namiki's 1957 film The Military Policeman and the Dismembered Beauty, and was traumatized by the film's depiction of a murder and dismemberment. 
which begins with a consensual sexual encounter that a young Itoi understandably misread as a sexual assault scene. Itoi remembers the process of writing Gygus' dialogue as an emotionally harrowing experience. He dictated the dialogue one character at a time as staff member Masayuki Mira typed it into the computer and was effectively reliving his own childhood trauma by imagining Gygus as the breast of the woman he believed had been assaulted in the movie, and he says that both him and Mira were at the edge of tears. And I don't want to sound like fucking Matt Pat here, but like reliving memories of childhood drama, doesn't that kind of sound like the primal therapy that spurred Plastic Ono Band in the first place? I think, whether or not it was intentional, Plastic Ono Band is an album that serves as a pretty good companion piece to the Mother games because it really does explore a lot of the ideas that Mother would later iterate on, and I think, if nothing else, it's worth exploring for that. Literally, every time I think a video is going to be quick and easy to make, it spirals out of control into a goddamn behemoth. Thank you so much for sitting through this whole thing. As much of a pain in the ass as the research process for this video was, it was really fun to check out all these bands, and I hope I've introduced you to some neat stuff too. I've spent a feature-length amount of time yammering about the bands that influenced Mother, so I guess I'll leave you off with an album that's not just my personal favorite work of music to be influenced by Mother, it's one of the best albums I've ever heard, period. I think along with XOC, Corey Johnson is one of the most underappreciated video game cover slash remix artists out there, and in 2014 he put out an album simply titled Earthbound. You think you need someone to pat you on the back? You think you need someone to tuck you in bed and not kiss you on the cheek and tell you that everything is over? If you're acquainted with bands like Mogwai, you'll definitely like this one. It's a post-rock epic that blends sprawling instrumental passages with extended samples, and while there are some portions of it that cover songs from Earthbound, it feels less concerned with accurately representing the game's soundtrack and more concerned with replicating the emotional journey the game puts you through. <laughs> And an emotional journey is definitely what I'd call the experience of listening to this album. I definitely can't recommend it enough. Anyway, you can open your eyes now. Sorry about your limbs, though. I am earthbound. I'm an RPG. Second game in a set of three. Didn't do so hot when I first debuted. But 30 years later, I've got attitude. Gray plastic coating with shiny parts inside. Put me in your console, because I'm a wild ride. The earth is in danger. We have to call on who? Four heroic teens, yes, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh. Hours of gameplay are down in my heart. It's not hard to believe I'm a work of art. I am earthbound. I'm one sick game. I am earthbound. You better know my name. I am earthbound. Yeah. Phone is ringing. Oh my god. It's, it's Ness's dad.